So hello everybody. Um, my name's Tim Bridgman and this is my second webinar for the Multilingual Families Club series. Um, today's webinar is called Inclusion in the Workplace and um, it's going to be a mix of personal stories combined with bits of theory and a couple of models that you can use. Um, I hope it's going to be of interest to you. Um, I'm going to start off um, by addressing the issue of multicultural teams, giving you a little bit of background on that. And from then onwards, um, we're going to be moving on to a very nice model that I'm aware of, which can help you um, analyze, assess, and place on one of three levels your team with regards to how good they are at inclusion and functioning as a diverse multicultural team. Um, yeah, so, right, how to begin and where to begin. Um, for the first bit of theory, I'm going to do it. Um, supposedly, this is an English technique. What you do is you give the story first, and then you give the supporting theory afterwards. Um, for the second bit of theory, I'm going to do it around the other way. But let's do it the English way for this time. So I would like to start off by telling you um, a story about my 10-year-old son's football career. Okay. Now, he's been playing football for a few years. Um, he's not serious or anything like that. He does it because he enjoys it. And his best football clubs are the ones where he has friends and they have fun. Okay. Now, he's been through a few football clubs over the years because what keeps on happening is something goes a bit wrong with the manager and it stops being fun. And then I come along to the trainings, see, mm, not a good manager, time to change, okay? So we were at this position where it was time to change when my son, um, he gets a phone call off of a very good club in the region, okay? And he gets invited to join one of the top clubs. Um, and we're told that, yeah, they're looking for more players, they're recruiting, please come along. So we go along and it seems quite good. Um, the trainer's very confident and he explains to us that they are looking for more players so that they can have two teams, okay, at his age, which was the, I think, like nine to ten year olds. So anyway, they get enough players for the two teams and we're told they're going to be two equal teams. They're just going to be divided, okay. But in reality, they weren't. When it came to time to split the teams, it soon became obvious that there was an A team and a B team. Okay. Now, my son was kind of middle-ish, sort of bottom middle-ish of the group. So he got put into the B team. And at the beginning, all of the kids in the B team were really unhappy. They weren't in the A team. Um, and uh, yeah, they were told there wasn't going to be an A team. But nevertheless, they carried on. And they, the two different teams got put in different leagues. And my son's team started playing matches in their league. And the first few matches were not good. They didn't really have much team spirit. They had uh, the manager's assistant looking after the team. Um, they knew that they were the B team. Hmm, didn't go too well. But remarkably, something then did happen. You see, the manager, um, he was under orders not to do anything because the A team manager was the boss. But what he did was he said to them, look, come on, guys, just have fun. OK, you're getting match experience. This is really good for everyone. Not many kids get this, so just have fun. And suddenly they started playing quite well. Now, this team was strange because it was a mix of, of, of 
new kids and different kids okay some of them were really good some of them were not so good you know some of them were they had they had different abilities okay and i don't know how perhaps it was because of the adverse situation but they actually managed to gel as a team and suddenly they started doing well and suddenly they were even nearly beating the top teams um and the B team was coming good. Meanwhile, the A team wasn't doing very well. It was underperforming. It should be one of the top teams in the region, but it wasn't getting the best results. Okay. So in response to this, the A team manager decided, right, somebody in the B team must be good. I'm going to take a couple of the players from the B team. So that's what happened. They took the best two players from the B team into the A team. And of course, this was heartbreaking at the time for the B team players. They lost their captain and their main players. Okay. And um, yeah, it effectively ended that B team in that form. Okay. Then the luckily it was at the end of the season. They didn't have to play again. And my son basically decided to uh, it's, it's not fun. He wanted to leave, okay? But over this period, actually, the A team did keep on playing and it kept on playing with the new best teams out of the B team. And surprise, surprise, nothing changed. It was still the same problems, okay? And I actually went and watched this A team once. And what was happening in the A team was they were all being groomed to be, I don't know, professional stars and they all wanted to win the match single-handedly and they all in times of adversity or difficulties they all tried these solo runs to, to win it on their own okay and it really was not working um yes what happened that the manager the at manager we did complain to him we did try to explain to him but he was of the belief that this is how life is they are learning lessons in life, okay, <laughs> as he saw it. And at the end of the day, we basically decided that, no, we if these are the lessons of life, we don't want our son to uh, continue in this team. So um, that's the reason why he, he wanted to leave and we agreed that he could leave. And um, the A team carried on struggling okay that's my story so why am i telling you the story at the beginning of this webinar on inclusion in the workplace okay i'm starting on this story because i now need to show you a little bit on um theory a theory called apollo teams by belbin so if you hang on one second i'm just going to start a presentation right so here we go so inclusion in the workplace by myself tim bridgman okay and here we go this is um here are some detail on belbin 1981 apollo teams research now this was conducted in england and it was conducted by belbin setting up these controlled experiments with a game called teamopoly now, Teamopoly is a business uh, challenge game, which is very similar to Monopoly, but with teams. Okay, you play it in teams, and at the end, the winner is the person who's earned the most money and has the most property or, or whatever, just like, like in Monopoly. Now, the idea was that they were going to have a number of teams, and most of these teams were... These teams were all going to be random with a random distribution of people with different abilities and backgrounds in the teams, except for one team, which was going to be the Apollo team. Now, the Apollo team was going to contain all of the high achievers. So everybody was asked to do an IQ or a personality and a personality test. They found the high flyers, the people, the intellectual people that were the most intellectual, with the most qualifications, with the best backgrounds, analytical and critical skills, etc. And they put all of these people into this Apollo team 
and then they ran the experiment. Now, as you can see, what happened was of the 25 games of Teamopoly, the Apollo team won only three times. Out of eight teams, they came sixth, sixth times, and fourth, four times. Okay, the Apollo team did not beat the other teams, rise to the top, establish itself as the best team. And Belbin concluded, in human affairs, nothing should be taken for granted, that a team of clever people should win in an exercise that placed a premium on cleverness seemed fairly obvious, but the Apollo team finished last. So they began analyzing what was going on with the Apollo team. Why was it underperforming? Why weren't the best people finishing first? And they found a number of issues, first of all, in decision making. They found that the Apollo teams consisted of many highly individualistic members. So obviously that's not good for teamwork. They wasted a lot of time on futile arguments um, and they re reached decisions more slowly. And when they did reach their decisions, these decisions were less liable to be followed properly. Okay, and the end effect was that the Apollo team, the competition within, the individualism within, was basically causing an internal intellectual competition that was therefore meaning that they couldn't make decisions, they couldn't stick to decisions. Okay, it was destroying them from within. Now, on the operational side, um, they found out that the Apollo team considered problem solving the most valuable and important activity above everything, strategy, okay? And they neglected routine jobs, general housekeeping, like maintenance and structure. Furthermore, they had a very narrow definition and perspective of team effectiveness. And this is perhaps the most shocking thing, that as they were playing they actually learnt the least out of all the teams from the exercise they just kind of got stuck okay so now looking at the football story we're beginning to realize it's the story of an apollo team now Further research and analysis started comparing Apollo teams to NBA teams, and it found a lot of the same problems, okay? The NBA teams were prone to Apollo syndrome. Um, and now, this is quite important because the NBA teams are supposedly the best, the future leaders. Um, people go along onto MBAs to, to network and meet contacts to carry through into the their later jobs with them, and it's, you know, they're, they're supposedly very important to MBA. And what did they find? That in MBA teams, there's this equally high IQ and analytical skills, similar domains of expertise, of course, strong intellectual competitiveness, and less value attached to housekeeping and organization. Um, there's basically, all of the problems of the standard uh, Apollo team is in an MBA team. So Belbin's findings were that the most effective teams are people, uh, are teams of people whose members' attributes are complementary. Even matching implies similarity, indeed conformity, of outlook and skills. This can mean everyone brings to the project the same range of skills and the same way of looking at things variety is crucial okay so here we go this is the key point of why the highest performing teams are diverse multicultural teams and not apollo teams okay apollo teams are all the people with the highest qualifications the best backgrounds the highest iqs but they are homogenous. They are people who bring into the team the same knowledge, the same skills, the same attitude. Now, if you get a diverse team, even if the people have less education, uh, lower 
critical thinking abilities uh, or, or IQ results, if they bring in different skills and different abilities and they get these to combine and to work together, this has a higher end result than the Apollo team. Right, so we have a nice map here because it's very important now to understand what is shown in this in, in this graph in front of you, okay? One axis performance. The second axis, the number of teams, how frequently they occur in, in, in a culture. And we can see the dominant, the most common is the homogenous team. Everyone from the same background, same abilities, okay? And we can see also that that's right in the middle of the performance scale. OK, because we know that diverse, well-managed teams outperform homogenous teams. But if we look at the numbers of diverse teams well-managed, we'll see that there is a very, very small amount of these. Now, the reason for this is it's very, very difficult to set up, maintain and manage one of these diverse, well-managed teams. My son's football club, his B team, it was lucky. The manager was told not to interfere, interfere, not to tell them anything because he wasn't the main manager. So he just told them, look, guys, have fun, enjoy each other's company. And out of that, the magical ingredients came into place and the, he was able to um, produce yeah, the team naturally happened, okay, and started winning, and then the confidence started growing, and they realized they were doing things. It was an accidental diverse team, well managed. The reality is that managing diverse teams is much, much more difficult than managing a homogenous team. And if you've got the wrong manager in charge who doesn't know how to do it, then we get into the first group the lowest group on the performance scale, diverse teams managed poorly. OK, now here it's a disaster. OK, it, nothing's happening. Results are bad. Everything's gone wrong. OK, which was what happened when my son's B team got interfered with and they took away the top players. They suddenly overnight turned into diverse team managed poorly. OK, and they weren't winning anything. It all went wrong, which is why my son went to, to leave, uh, wanted to leave. OK, so that's what I want you to take away from this. Um, the idea of Apollo teams, even the homogenous Apollo team, which is right at the top of that area on the homogenous teams. Um, uh, sorry, right on the on the right hand side. Um, And how difficult it is to hold these diverse, well-managed teams together. And also, we're going to look at you know, how they fall apart, why they fall, about, fall, fall apart, and what you do then. OK. Right. So on to the next bit of theory. And this time, we go the other way around. Theory first, example second. OK. So the next bit of theory is this. It's a paper called Diversity, Making Differences Matter by Thomas and Eli from 1996. Now, what I like about this paper is its simplicity. It basically creates three levels. And these are the three levels of successful inclusion in a multicultural team. Okay, in a diverse team. Now, starting at the bottom, it's the least successful. Okay, but we don't start at nothing. We start at the first level of attempting to be inclusive. And then we go up to the top. And the top level is supposedly the golden goose, in which you've got the high performing uh, diverse team. So let's look at these three levels then. 
the first level is the discrimination and fairness paradigm now um, let's read the description then so it says prejudice has kept members of certain demographic groups um, out of organizations such as ours as a matter of fairness and to comply with law we need to work towards restructuring the makeup of our organization to let it more closely reflect society we need managerial processes that ensure that all our employees are treated equally and with respect and that some are not given unfair advantage over others right so the idea here is to avoid discrimination in the workplace say for example you're working in a company and the company um, is all the dominant group cultural group of that area that you live in okay but in fact the society outside of that company does not reflect that it has i don't know 10 percent of people that are from outside of that dominant group so of different religions or different ethnic minorities or immigrants or, or, or from wherever okay so here what we've got is this idea hmm that doesn't sound fair that doesn't sound correct so we need to make sure that our recruitment takes on people to reflect society therefore we need 10 percent of the people to be non-dominant group once we've done that bingo we are a multicultural company uh, team reflecting society that's the idea so the next paradigm is a level up from that and this is called the access and legitimacy paradigm and here we go we are living in an increasingly multicultural world where new cultural groups are quickly gaining consumer power our company needs a more diverse workforce to help us gain access to these new markets we need employees with multicultural and multilingual skills in order to understand and serve our new customers better and to gain legitimacy within them diversity isn't just fair it makes business sense okay so the first group then you had 10 percent of employee of people in the group from not the dominant cultural group okay but apart from that not a lot had changed they were actually functioning by the rules and the regulations and the systems that were in place and established by the cultural group it's just there were some slightly different faces there now here the penny has dropped that hang on if 10 percent of society is from a different cultural group this is an untapped market if we have somebody working in our company that knows that cultural group perhaps they can access it I've got an idea why don't we put them in charge of managing marketing or sales or whatever to that cultural group so now the person from the non-dominant cultural group is actually getting a bit more responsibility okay and they're getting better work but hang on there's still an issue nothing has changed yet above them so let's now look at the last group the learning and effectiveness paradigm just like the discrimination paradigm we promote equal opportunities for all individuals and just like the access paradigm we acknowledge cultural difference as key to connecting with new markets but we go one step further we try to internalize our differences among employees so that we all learn to grow because of them our goal is long-term transformation process to use identity to use to identify group differences to promote organizational growth and when fully in place all members of the organization can say that they were on the same team with our differences not despite them okay so the key thing here is about learning okay say new faces are invited into a homogenous team say a new market is opened up by these new people okay 
that shouldn't be the end of it. What should happen now is there should be a knowledge sharing within that team. The new knowledge that has been brought in that has been effective should be passed on to the other members. Okay, just like the other members should be passing on their knowledge. Everybody should be sharing knowledge. Everybody should collectively be raising their knowledge level. Okay. And then from this situation, it shouldn't matter who gets further promoted to higher levels because everybody's working on this same shared collective knowledge base. So it can be anyone. Unlike the last level, people are not trapped in their minority role to their minority market. And this is supposedly the golden goose, the high achieving um, multicultural team. Right, so let's just look at these a little bit. Um, and we've got some details on how work gets done in these different types of companies. And now that you're getting familiar with this, perhaps you can start thinking about who you work for and on which level they are and as we will find out in a little while this is dynamic they go up and down and up and down okay so discrimination and fairness paradigm people in different cultural groups should work as if every person were of the same race gender and nationality an individual's culture should not influence the way that work gets done this is about standardization okay and the company has its way of working race gender anything else should not affect this everyone's equal everyone follows the same rules okay but as you can guess these rules are set up by the homogenous team the the dominant culture so how does work get done in the next level the main virtue people in different cultural groups have to offer at work is a knowledge of their own cultural group so people are given work that relates to their specific cultural background with clients, customers that belong to that cultural background. So we've mentioned this already. You are typecast, pigeonholed, whatever you want to call it. OK, you're there to unlock, to give away the secrets of your cultural background to help unlock a new market. And then what happens next? So finally, the next one, learning and effectiveness, makes a direct connection between diverse cultural groups and diverse work perspectives, then tries to incorporate all these new perspectives into the main culture of the organization, changing how people work in all areas and on all levels. So incorporate all this new knowledge into every level of the organization very very difficult right so one last well oh, hang on two more things okay so this next one exists in organizations with the following cultural values so the discriminus discrimination of fairness paradigm Organizations tend to have entrenched, easily observable organizational culture in which values like fairness are widespread and codes of conduct are clear and unambiguous. They also tend to be bureaucratic in structure with control processes in place for monitoring, measuring and rewarding performance. Top down directives are needed to enforce such initiatives and leaders are quick to subvert differences in the interest of preserving harmony. So let's think about leadership here. The leader here has to be very hierarchical, top down, um, enforcing initiatives and directives. OK, and if anyone suggests anything different, they actually have to suppress them in order to preserve harmony. So the more we're looking at this, the more we're thinking, hmm, they meant well at the beginning, but what is the point? Access and legitimacy. Organizations tend to be in pursuit of short-term gains, with leaders not having the time or resources to identify and analyze the cultural-based skills, beliefs, and practices worked so well in minority markets. 
Leaders tend to push staff with niche capabilities into learning pigeonholes without understanding their capabilities or incorporating these into other areas of the organization. Now, I can't talk for every outsourcing company, but I know that outsourcing companies are very fast operators uh, who are all about short-term contracts, short-term gains. And yes, suddenly, if they need to get a contract for someone in, I don't know, in Italy, they need an Italian person there to help out, to do the communications, to do the writing, to do whatever. Okay, so I have seen a lot of high-tech, modern outsourcing companies follow this strategy. But um, yeah, most of these companies are about short-term gains and the turnover of people is very high and contracts are very short-term, short length. So the next one then, learning and effectiveness. Organizations understand a diverse workforce has different perspectives and approaches to work and truly values this variety of opinions and insights. High standards are expected of all and leaders expect the learning opportunities and challenges that the various different perspectives present. Organizations are egalitarian and non-bureaucratic and have open-minded cultures. Leaders work against all forms of dominance subordination that inhibit full contribution, personal development and organizational effectiveness. So now your leader is completely different. Okay, your leader is there um, yeah, to prevent any form of subordination. They're there to serve the people. Um, it's like servant leadership is, is a model that's often used um, with reference to leadership and multicultural teams. And now it's about getting everyone to feel part of it, getting everyone to feel at home and welcome, contributing. Um, back to my son's football team, the lucky magic ingredient there was he just told everyone to have fun together. Um, but nevertheless, it turns out that this leadership model is the very, very difficult thing to do and that very few people can do it. Um, and as we saw earlier on, the people that like their positions they, and hierarchy are not going to be able to do this. So I guess we can, we've got a good idea on all of these already. It's the long-term effects on employees and staff. Um, discrimination and fairness. Um, idealizes assimilation through conformism and encourages cultures to blend. Such organizations have no grasp on what diversity is, except for numbers. Driven by morals and ethics, they actually end up limiting the employees who must hide parts of themselves to fit in. This makes it difficult to engage fully in both work and the workplace. So here they found out the end effect is the non-dominant cultural group employees actually have to hide this. Okay, the middle group accepts and celebrates cultural differences, but only in the pursuit of niche markets. These organizations emphasize the role of differences without really analyzing those differences to see how they actually affect how the work is done. This can leave employees feeling segregated and feeling that opportunities in other parts of the organization are cut off to them. OK, so now the culture is out in the open, but there's segregation. OK, and nobody wants to be in a team where they feel they're in a segregated group, the B team. OK, so finally, the learning and effectiveness paradigm seeks to understand the deep connections between culture and work, encourages staff to use whatever aspects of themselves they think will make them more effective in their jobs. The whole purpose is to do the work effectively and not to fit a preset formula on how to behave. Such organizations give learning and change priority over familiarity. And as a result, diverse professionals feel valued and secure. So here, what to say? No preset formula. This is why they're so difficult to lead. There's no preset formula. There's no 
magic way to guarantee you're going to do this. It's different for every team, okay? But then we find out when it does happen, when it does work, the results are diverse professional staff feel valued and secure, which means they stay together. They don't break that team. They try as hard as they can not to break the team. My son was heartbroken when his B team was broken after they had gelled. Okay, they wanted all to keep in that B team. The players that got moved to the A team, I don't think they even wanted to be moved to the A team. Right. Okay, so that's the end of the theory. Thank you for bearing with me there. Let me just turn this off. And what I'm going to do now is, um, you may have heard from my other webinars, um, I have spent a lot of my working career abroad. Um, also, I'm very eclectic and I've done many different jobs for many different people. Um, I'm a bit of a free spirit and I always like a new challenge and I always like learning new things. So quite often I do end up changing both jobs and professions. Now, what I'm going to do now is I think that I have had direct experience of all three of these levels while living and working as a British-born person in Poland. So I thought it would be fun to tell you three stories, and each story is going to show you my experiences on a level, okay? And then I'm going to tell you what happened at the end of it. As I keep on saying, these teams are very dynamic and things change, circumstances change, people change unavoidably. And the moment you think you've got something, it disappears. So let me tell you about my, um, my first story then, okay? So this is the discrimination and fairness paradigm. Now, it was, this was the most difficult for me to find an example of for myself. Um, but I think, actually, the best example is when I very, very first came to Poland at the beginning. And when I came here, I didn't actually come here with concrete plans. Um, I was interested in Polish culture. I'd saved up some money, and I wanted the challenge of trying to organize some events in Poland to see what would happen, because I, I, I was kind of involved in this kind of work back in England. Now, I really came over wanting to do something creative, to work with people here on creative projects. And I had experience both in film, which was my education, and music, which was my passion. And I came over here trying to do things. Um, sorry, I'm speaking to you from Poland now, which is why it's here. Um, I came over wanting to get things going, and unfortunately, nothing happened. Um, people were initially very suspicious of me. This was a long time ago, and Poland has changed greatly since, so this wouldn't happen now. But 20 years ago, there were very few uh, foreigners here, and... Mm, nothing happened at all basically i hit a brick wall people would check me out wouldn't know what to make of me and they wouldn't take the plunge to do something okay so i had no option i started doing things on my own and this kind of opened the door for the first time and i forced my own way into the room and then once i was into this room it was tricky and i actually found myself playing the discrimination and fairness paradigm at this point and i started saying to people hang on what's going on here polish people are able to go abroad and to integrate and work in other countries so shouldn't i be able to here and furthermore i consider myself a European. Yes, Brexit is wonderful for me. And you guys, you're also Europeans, yeah? So we're going to have the same passports. So 
what's the issue? Okay, and furthermore, I was working with film and music, and this is international culture. Particularly music is very influenced by British culture. So I actually felt, hang on, I have a right to be part of this. Um, so some people did over time become interested in me. Other people didn't, um, considered me as, I don't know, intruding on in a place where I wasn't wanted, making changes where it didn't need changes to be made. However, I was in, and I was looking after myself, organizing things for myself. And um, yes, it was an, an interesting period, a difficult period and an interesting period. Um, it was my introduction into realizing just how competitive people and work is in Poland. Um, for me, culture wasn't work. There was a big gap between culture and work. But for most of the people who were involved with culture, they very much had career plans for the future. And that was a very, very big difference. But nevertheless, I did start making friends. Um, and I can remember getting some very nice words off of some people. Um, you know, I will never forget it when somebody told me that, you know, please stay, Wood really needs people like you. And, and that meant the earth to me at the time. Um, in retrospect, when looking back at it now, um, I realized that this was my introduction to playing by Polish roles as a foreigner. And I also recognize that the only way to begin, get established, to grow something was to find a way to function in this homogenous team. Um, so that's what I did. Okay, so that's the end of the first story about the discrimination and fairness and the me being the minority in the homogenous team. So my next story then is a few years after that and, oh, not that long actually, but, and I ended up um, staying longer than expected and going into a full-time job. And the full-time job um, was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, I ended up joining a international department at a university. Um, it was a humanities department doing literature and culture. And this went surprisingly well. Okay. I got the offer. I went along. I got the job. I joined the team and I started meeting my colleagues and they were all very, very welcoming. Um, they were really happy to have um, people from from outsiders come in and join the group, add a little bit of spice, add some authenticity. Um, and with regards to management, um, I had a manager who had, uh, I suppose, the same approach as my son's B team manager. They were very hands off. They empowered the foreign members of staff, of which there were a couple of others, just to do the thing in the way that they knew how to do it. And they didn't want to intrude. They didn't want to spoil the magic if there was going to be magic. And this was their management technique. Okay. Now, this actually brought very good results. And the foreigners within the university, within my uh, department and faculty, were getting great results. And not only that, um, they were building on them and they were doing things like starting literary journals or theatre companies. Um, I opened up uh, new media studies in digital literature for the very first time. And um, yeah, for a while it was a happy family, essentially. Um, yeah, the students were happy. They liked the new courses. The... Um, domestic national members of staff they they were very happy everything was growing recruitment was great um and again i can remember 
my manager at one point telling me, you can't leave, you belong here. <laughs> and I was very touched by this again. It always has a great effect on foreigners, this. So. And um, yeah, everything was working. And um, I think the key to this was we were allowed creative freedom. We were allowed to use our own materials. We brought in authenticity. We brought in passion. Okay. And here we go, the turning point. Well, on the whole, this was very good. At the same time, there was a few undercurrents, okay, where you could tell that some members of staff, perhaps a little jealous. Um, one issue for sure was foreigners had um, yeah, they would want to go home and see their families at Christmas and Easter and to do a little bit of traveling and so on and so on. It, and it was much more expensive to be a foreigner living in Poland without contacts, where to get things cheaper. So they realized this initially and they gave foreigners a higher wage. But over time, this began to cause resentment as, as well, okay, and perhaps planted the seeds of resentment. Now, the big change happened when a restructuring was announced. Um, lots of things were going on. The humanities were failing to recruit people, while the social sciences were recruiting more and more people. There was plans to go to a new building. And then the thing that really affected the foreign members of staff was all the foreign members of staff um, lent a hand with practical English teaching also. And it was announced that there was going to be a digital platform introduced. Now, the platform was to be developed within social sciences, not within humanities. And furthermore, it then became obvious that no foreign member of staff was going to be involved in the preparation or planning of this platform. And at the end, there was going to be a standardized course and resources that all the foreigners were going to be asked to use instead of their own unique resources and their own unique methodologies, which had led to these great results happening. So, this went down like a lead balloon with all of the foreign members of staff. Um, and yes, many chose, particularly the practical English teachers, um, chose that it was time to move on. Um, but those, even those not directly connected into practical English, it, it revealed something else. It revealed a limit, a glass ceiling to this team that we were in. There was supposedly an oasis of multiculturalism. And it became very clear that as a non-Polish member of staff, you would never get a management position. You would never get a, a pr promotion to a position of responsibility uh, to, to ever achieve anything. So I think you can guess what happened. The majority of the high performing foreign staff left. Um, it returned to becoming a homogenous team. Um, they relocated buildings, had a new start. I gather things have improved and there's a difference in climate, but definitely it went from a well managed, a high performance team by accident to the low performance team and settled then on the homogenous team. And I guess the hope and plans for many people there is in the future they might achieve the high performance team again. So that's my second experience, okay, of being used to unlock a market to provide authenticity, but then ultimately finding myself pigeonholed and unable to move. So on to the last one, and this is yet another career, <laughs> okay, so my experiences at the university of being in a multicultural team that then went wrong got me very interested in the subject 
of multiculturalism and discrimination within the workplace. And I began getting my background after this experience. And I, over a period of time, I actually became good enough in this to start offering my services um, as a corporate trainer in diversity and inclusion that I did for a couple of years in multicultural communication. And I arranged a couple of conferences as well um, on this subject. And while this was a great time, while this was a great learning experience, it was a bit early to be doing this stuff. And Poland is a, a tricky place to function in by anyone's standards. And at the end of the day, after doing this for a while, I began to realize that I was basically in, involved in kind of a charitable social awareness exercise, that this was never actually going to bring in enough money to be able to um, continue indefinitely. So I started thinking about what to do next, and I didn't know what to do. And then, out of the blue, a big surprise happened. A Perhaps the top marketing advertising agency in Poland at the time. Um, somehow, we discovered each other. And they saw my marketing for the conferences and my courses and so on and so on. And I saw a job description for a, uh, a job, full time job as a marketing copywriter. And I went to an interview and it was all very sudden, all very informal. Um, I decided after my past experiences that I knew exactly what I wanted and that was only to be in an open multicultural team. Um, I guess I was quite difficult in the interview and I told them that and what I was expecting <laughs> and the only type of job that I would be interested in and they hired me on the spot. So it was all a big surprise. So. I started commuting off to Poznan, where I arrived and I found this, I don't know, this really unusual creative team. Okay, um, I was the only foreign member in the team, but within this team, they were as diverse as you could get, completely different personalities. And yet they were all very tight. They were socializing together. They were very much a team. Um, and, you know, it was kind of wasn't really obvious who the manager was. Um, it turns out that within this team, there was a big range of different personalities. There was a LGBT presence. There was, there was, you know, as multicultural as you can get within a team of all Polish people okay and they were very happy to have me and I fitted in very nicely um, and very welcoming very very open right from the beginning now my work there initially was a level two job there was a UK client that had great potential but they weren't able to unlock it there the Polish writers writing in English just weren't able to do the job so they decided we have to get a foreigner, a British person in to do this, which was me. However, this was an international company and it wasn't just work for British markets. It was pan-European work in every different market. And what happened was I was having to write the master copies in English and then they would go out for what was called transcreation into the other language. And with my multicultural skills, which are incredibly useful in the workplace, I set about learning communication guidelines for these different territories that I was writing in and writing in English in a communication structure that fitted these other territories, which then enabled seamless translation into that territory's language. Okay. And yeah, this was this was great. This was a great challenge. And suddenly I was getting 
amazing results, not just in Britain, but in other places. Um, people started trusting me. Um, I started working closely with designers, which is something that I enjoyed, and getting some creative input as well. And yeah, th this is what this company was like. They had the attitude that, okay, you'll be admitted on one job, but if they then discover that you're good at something else, you're free to go in that direction. And you're there because your personality fitted in with the group more than anything else. That was the key thing. Um, so anyway, I, I carried on in this job. It was all going quite well. And <laughs> yep, here we go. Another restructuring. The company was taken over and it had been bought up a year ago and there was supposedly going to be a smooth transition over to the new manager to the new owning company but it didn't happen this way overnight there was a decision that the new company owning company wanted to take over wanted to do things their way and all of the present management was pretty much immediately laid off okay so as you we know from all the different teams we've looked at the team was straight away broken okay and we know how delicate these teams are now they kept some people myself included and they tried to rebuild the team with people from the warsaw headquarters who were i guess i mean the people in warsaw were the people who weren't the previous managers who hadn't been asked to leave. So it was pretty clear that new management would be following new procedures. For me, it looked bad straight away. And the main reason for that was my, my new manager didn't even have very good fluent working English. Um, so, I tried explaining, sharing my knowledge, how I, how, how I, what my secrets were to successfully writing for these other markets to the new manager, but I don't know. It just he didn't appear to even hear what I was saying, and pretty soon, the other copywriters in the head office in Warsaw were after the jobs that I was doing. They considered them prestigious, and they wanted them. And they were going back to a bit similar to when I first arrived. They had this idea of copywriting being a, a standardized style in English as a foreign language, and that you could master this one language, this one style, apply it to everything everywhere. And it was very, very obvious. It was. A return to a homogenous team, if not collapse of um, badly run multicultural team. And furthermore, it was made very clear that I was no longer wanted. Um, so that brought to an end my experience on the top level of a learning and effectiveness paradigm multicultural team. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of this webinar. So what can we take away from this? Um, I very much like this scale, okay? And I like reminding myself of it and thinking about how is the team that I work with? Where are they placed on this scale? Um, Apollo Teams is also crucial to always carry with you because um, yeah, whenever you feel a homogenous Apollo team happening, if you want to work in a diverse environment, it's time to leave. Um, I think the big lesson from all of this is just how fragile these teams are and how they don't last long. They can get broken on purpose or by accident. They can get broken by bad management or just unavoidable things. Somebody gets ill or somebody has to leave or, or whatever. So 
Yeah, if you like diversity, if you want to be part of a high achieving team, um, get ready for the, the, the good and the bad. Um, you're getting one of these teams at some point, hopefully. It will be a buzz. You'll do work that you're very proud of. You'll feel stable and secure and put in lots of effort and energy into your work. But these things are dynamic and they change. And ultimately, this type of team is the hardest team to have. Um, you know, the world is so competitive nowadays. And international competition means that someone somewhere is going to have this um, intercultural, diverse, high-performing team. Um, when Trump got in power in the States and he started putting travel embargoes on, on people from Arabic states, the, the people that kicked up the biggest fuss were the Silicon Valley people because they realize if they are going to beat everyone worldwide, they have to have the peak of world talent and they have to make this worldwide talent into a diverse multicultural team. So they were the ones that were protesting at the airports against this because they knew that they would lose their competitive edge and how fragile it was and, and how somebody else could take over where they could put together these teams without restriction. So that's the world we live in. <laughs> that's what that's what people are like. Um, it would be great if there were more leaders and, and managers that knew about this and studied this. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I'm patiently waiting and looking forward to my next time when I'm able to fall into a really creative and productive multicultural and international team. So that's it. Thank you for staying with me. My name is Tim Bridgman, and I hope you have enjoyed this webinar entitled Inclusion in the Workplace. Goodbye.